What is up amigos? Today we're talking about the lift over a rotating cylinder with potential flow. So in last week's video, we went through the flow over just a regular cylinder that isn't rotating. Now we'll be going through the rotating aspect. So in the last video we had to find a cylinder, the flow over it, we could combine the potential solution for a uniform flow plus a doublet flow. And if you don't know about this, check out this video here where we went through it. And that was for a stationary cylinder. But what if we want to have a rotating cylinder? Because as we'll see later on in this video, this the results from this apply to air force and really any lifting body. And it's really quite amazing. We've gone through it in a different way in another video, this video. But in this video, we'll be going through the derivation of it and showing how applicable it is. So to find a rotating cylinder, the flow over it and the lift over it, we need to add an additional potential flow mechanism, another type of flow, and that is a vortex. So we have the uniform flow, we have the doublet, and now we have a vortex superimposed on both of those with a strength of gamma. The important thing to note is that the center of the vortex is also the center of the doublet. And if we combine all these three together, we end up getting a cylinder that's rotating at some kind of speed, and we have the strength of the vortex is gamma, and we have the streamlines that actually bend to like this, as opposed to the stationary cylinder where the flow just came straight in and out. So we have two points here, A and B, which is where the flow stagnates. And like the stationary cylinder, there are two points at the front and back, one each. But here, because the cylinder is rotating, these points have been skewed. And the cylinder has a radius of R. So let's go through and find the stream function first for this flow, the com combination of all three, so that we can derive what the velocities are, then the pressure coefficient over the entire airfoil, over the entire cylinder, and then the lift coefficient, and then how that applies to airfoils as well. So first of all, the stream function of just the uniform flow and the doublet from last video was V infinity, so the free stream velocity, R, which is the distance you are away from the center, sine theta, this is in polar coordinates by the way, one minus capital R, which is the radius of the cylinder, divided by little r squared. Now psi two, which is for just the vortex by itself, is gamma, the strength of the vortex, the circulation, which we've covered in this video as well, uh, divided by two pi, ln little r on capital R. So combining these two, which is great because we can always combine two different string functions to get a third string function, which is the combination of all string functions that we have. So psi equals this one plus this one. So that is V infinity R sine theta, one minus R squared on R squared, and then plus gamma on two pi, ln little r on capital R. So that is the strain function for this flow here. Let's find what the velocities are in the VR and V theta components. So we know that from the strain function to find VR from the strain function is just one on R d psi on d theta, so partial derivatives, and that comes out to be one minus r squared on r squared, capital R, little r, v infinity cos theta, and v theta, to find that is minus d psi on d theta, the partial derivative, which equals minus one plus r squared on little r squared, v infinity sine theta, minus gamma on two pi r. So with these two equations, anywhere in the flow from this point in the r and the theta directions, we can find out what the velocity is. That's really powerful. Now let's find what these stagnation points are because there are three different cases and it's actually quite interesting what happens. So that to find out the stagnation point, we just need to set both of these uh, velocities to zero because we know that at the stagnation point, there is no velocity. So anywhere on this surface, we know that the vr component, this component is going to be zero. So the r equals zero simply because little r now equals capital R, so that goes to zero and the entire thing goes to zero. So we know that the first comp component is r and we need to know what the theta components are. So with v theta though, we have a little bit more of a complicated situation. So we know that v theta needs to equal zero for the stagnation points and rearranging this equation here, we then get theta equals arc sine minus gamma on four pi v infinity capital R. So this presents us with three unique solutions and 
two quite, or at least one very interesting one and another one which is quite interesting. So sine, we know, goes from minus one to plus one. Sine from zero to two pi ranges from minus one to plus one, depending on which, what the theta is. But in this equation, we can see that gamma, the circulation of this vortex, can be a greater than the denominator. So that means that arc sine is greater than one, which means that, um, well, there's no theta that really corresponds to that. So we get an imaginary situation, but let's cover first the simple situation, which is where this top, the numerator, gamma, is lower than this denominator. In this particular case, V infinity R, it is quite easy to solve to get what theta is, and we'll get these two points based on the two different theta coordinates. But what about when gamma now equals four pi V infinity R? So in other words, the numerator equals the denominator. There's only one situation where arc sine will equal um, this theta, and that is on the bottom here. And the reason why is because uh, gamma is positive, so the top solution can't really exist, so it's the bottom solution. So this occurs at three pi on two, or minus pi on two, will equal um, one. Sine of three pi on two equals one. But now what about if gamma is greater than four pi to the infinity r? Now we get quite an interesting thing happening. So we need to come back to the v theta here and vr and sub in minus pi on two into this equation and rearrange for r. So we can't actually say that r equals r anymore because that doesn't exist anywhere on this cylinder. And what we'll find is little r equals gamma on four pi v infinity plus or minus gamma on four pi v infinity squared minus capital R squared and square root all of this. And what we find is now we actually get two situations. They're both in line with three pi on two. We have one stagnation point down here and another stagnation point somewhere in the solid. So the flow will actually come up, hit this point, come down, and the rest of the flow will go over it. And that is because this gamma is so much stronger than the free stream flow and the doublet strength effectively, it overrides it. And that means that we do have two stagnation points, but one is imaginary effectively in real life because that's inside the cylinder, which as we know from other videos, anything that happens inside this bounding streamline, it doesn't really affect the outside flow. It's just an additional to it. And we can have this as the dividing part between the external flow and the internal flow. And the external flow is what we're interested in. So that is the stagnation points. What about the pressure coefficient CP on this surface? So on the surface, we know that VR will always equal zero. And first of all, we know that for compressible flows, CP equals mi one minus V on V infinity squared. That's a two there. Okay, so what is V? V we know is VR is zero, but V theta isn't zero on the surface. So VR, V equals actually V theta, which equals minus two V infinity sine theta minus gamma on two pi r. So subbing that into CP, we then get CP equals one minus minus two sine theta minus gamma on two pi r V infinity squared. So that means that as long as we know what theta is, we can calculate what the pressure coefficient on this entire cylinder surface is. That's really powerful. Not only are we getting general information about what the pressure is doing here, we can then calculate all other sorts of quantities, including the lift and drag. Now the lift is very important for rotating cylinders. So let's calculate this and we'll see how this relates to another thing that we've looked at. So CL here. So CL equals the, if we divide this in half, because we know that the pressure always acts, if we have a cylinder, we know the pressure always acts normal to a surface. It can't act at a, different angle to it. So to find the lift of a cylinder, or any object really, you have to decompose each one of these pressure vectors into the lift component and then summate them. Now we know for the lower half of the cylinder, the component of the pressure in the lift direction will always be positive, and for the above, it's gonna be negative because this part is pushing the cylinder down, this half is pushing the cylinder up. So we can effectively um, break this into half, it doesn't really matter too much, but I'm just breaking this down into a few more steps so it's easy to follow and just a general uh, information kind of thing. So CL is the integral of zero to C from, so 
the bottom half, zero to C, of the pressure on the lower surface, the pressure coefficient, dot dx, minus one on C, uh, zero to C, the pressure on pressure coefficient on the upper surface, dot dx. Now, putting this all into the wash, it comes out to be CL equals minus half integral from zero to two pi, CP sine theta dot d theta. So we're breaking this down so that the sine theta takes into account the direction effectively, and we're integrating this CP around the cylinder. So knowing this, we can effectively determine what the pressure, the lift coefficient is over the cylinder. And that CP is up here, which we've determined. If we come and substitute that into here and just work it out, we have CL equals gamma on R, the infinity. Now this results in the lift per unit length equals half rho infinity v infinity uh, squared s cl, and that equals half rho v infinity uh, rho v infinity squared here two r two r is the equivalent of s for a cylinder here gamma on r v infinity. And that results in the lift per unit length is rho infinity, v infinity, gamma. And this is the Kutler-Joukowsky theorem, which we've gone through in this video. And by knowing the circulation around any object, you can literally just plug that value into here, know the velocity, the density, figure out what the lift per unit length is. So that is how powerful this has been built up to over the last few weeks, going from literally just a uniform flow all the way to now any object that is has some circulation, you can calculate the lift through this method. So that's the end of this video. If you liked it, make sure to click the like and subscribe button. And I'll see you next one. Peace, amigos.